With the upcoming inauguration, the news and lots of people have been talking about the no-fly zones that were announced, and I've had many friends approach me and ask me about what's involved there. Well, I'm going to provide a little insight from a fighter pilot's perspective. As a fighter pilot, I've been involved in no-fly zones and restricted airspace. And also as a civilian pilot, as an airline pilot, an airshow pilot, I've been very aware of no-fly zones and restricted airspace. So I have a unique insight into this from both sides of the equation. Specifically, I'd like to shed a little bit of light on Inauguration Day and what's occurring over the capital area. Firstly, what is the Inauguration No-Fly Zone? Well, foremost, there already exists a no-fly zone, a restricted airspace over the capital area, an area that extends around 30 nautical miles around the capital area, where it's quite restrictive going in there, only specific commercial airlines and designated airplanes that have approval already. Of course, for Inauguration Day, there's even more heightened restrictions and a, and a specific no-fly zone that aircraft cannot enter that airspace unless they have specific clearance, and that's probably going to be a medevac situation or a military airplane. But this isn't the only restriction surrounding the inauguration. In fact, there's been a restriction over Biden's residence since November, and that goes right up until he moves into the White House. While the news speaks of these restrictions and no-fly zones in a general sense, pilots must read flight advisories and something called a NOTAM, a Notice to Airmen, and they outline the limitations, the altitudes, the distances of those specific restrictions. Those are very important. Technically, a pilot needs to read the NOTAMs for the area they're flying in every time they go flying. And so it's really important to turn to those, but it's also very important to understand how to read the NOTAM and outline the restrictions for that day. Another means of being aware of these restrictions with modern flight tablets and integrated aircraft mapping systems. And often these are updated live and they provide a God's eye view of the map area that the pilot is flying in and provide those live restrictions often in red circles. And that really does facilitate the pilot having situational awareness of where he's flying and where those restrictions are. So today there's not many excuses for a pilot to miss a restriction or no-fly zone, yet it still happens. But I would hope any pilot worth his or her salt would know that Inauguration Day would involve some fairly specific no-fly zones. Are flight restrictions and no-fly zones a new thing for Inauguration? Actually, no, it was the same in 2016 and 2017 for Trump, not only over his house in Manhattan and Trump Tower, but also on Inauguration Day as well. Obviously, this time, there's an even more heightened sense of security over the capital area given the recent security breaches. So how do they control a no-fly zone, they being civilian air traffic control and the military? Well, foremost, they use the existing air traffic control radar systems and they integrate those with the military operation as well. Often there's a temporary tactical military radar set up in the area. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was an airborne radar, an AWACS aircraft patrolling out there as well, again, providing a different type of radar signature. And almost certainly there'll be airborne fighter intercept aircraft with their own onboard radars that can facilitate and integrate with the air traffic control and the military radars. So why a no-fly zone anyways? Rather than identify, track, and determine the intentions of an aircraft entering the airspace, whether that's hostile or friendly, it's far easier to remove everything from the airspace and focus on the odd airplane that might come close or in the airspace. And then, once an aircraft can come in there, they can allocate those assets, whether they're airborne radars or fighter intercept aircraft, to go interrogate what that might be, what's called a bogey that enters the airspace. The term bogey refers to a contact without known intentions, hostile or friendly. And it's just like my cat is actually named bogey because then and now I'm still not sure of its intentions. But the goal of a no-fly zone is to have what's called air supremacy, which means total control of the airspace. What are the threats to a no-fly zone? Well, as we sadly know, aircraft can be used for nefarious reason and cause considerable damage. That would be the primary threat. And increasingly so in the past 10 years, drones, both large and small, have the ability to penetrate no-fly airspace. While most drones 
issues are just having a looky-loo the potential exists for somebody to do something nefarious with a drone also so the big question what can be done if something enters the airspace well for an aircraft they'd initially try communications both on the regular air traffic control frequencies for that airspace but also on something which is called guard frequency 121.5 megahertz and that's a frequency all pilots should be monitoring and it's a backup frequency for air traffic control to get a hold of somebody in case someone gets lost on the frequencies or that main frequency st stops working for some reason. Then if communication doesn't work, then there'll be some sort of interrogation option, likely an intercept in the case of a no-fly zone over the capital. If there was no corrective action from the intruding aircraft through communications, there would be an intercept ultimately. And likely what would occur is a fighter aircraft would come up alongside that aircraft uh, or fly past it to make themselves known while the other fighter aircraft might hang back for mutual support. They may try to escort that aircraft away or in the absolute worst case scenario, if that intruding aircraft demonstrated hostile intent, the fighter aircraft would engage and likely destroy that airplane. For a drone, well, for sure it's harder to intercept a drone with a fighter aircraft, but there are certainly ways to intercept and neutralize a drone. And I would assume they'd go straight to neutralizing it because if a drone is in there, it's likely not an accident. It's not like an aircraft where a pilot might be just off course or perhaps didn't read the NOTAM. There are three basic ways to neutralize a drone. Spoofing, that's messing with the GPS signal. It tricks the drone into thinking it's in the wrong place and moves it effectively. Then there's electronic attack using electromagnetic weapons. It disables the drone, scrambles its circuits, literally fries them and neutralizes and destroys the drone and fall out of the sky. Then there's physically and kinetically neutralizing or destroying a drone. They use net launchers. There's even birds that have been trained to take out small drones. The bottom line is they take restricted airspace and no-fly zones very seriously, particularly during this inauguration. You don't want to be that pilot that wanders in there. You don't want to be that drone operator that flies in there to get that cool shot. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've got a little insight into what's going to occur on Inauguration Day in terms of restricted airspace and the no-fly zone over the capital and the implications of an aircraft or drone going into that airspace. Please like, subscribe, and check out my other fun aviation content on my channel. We'll see you next time. Cheers.